And so without further ado, I, I, in terms of the launch, I'd like to hand straight over to Brian Lawton, who is the Road Safety Foundation's Research and Programme Manager, to present this year's results. And remember, keep putting your questions in for the panel session at the end. So it's over to you, Brian. Thank you for the introduction, Tony, and, and good morning. Can you hear me all right? Brilliant. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to talk through some of the um, results contained within the report that we've published today. Um, I'm happy to take any questions or sort of clarification at the end of my presentation and then any sort of more discursive issues we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have as part of the wider panel uh, later on. Uh, firstly then, for those who are less familiar with our work, um, we look at the number of fatal and serious crashes and our main focus is on individual road user risk. So our crash risk, risk maps indicate the number of fatal and serious injury crashes per vehicle kilometre travelled and we look over a three year period um, and we present the results in five bands. Uh, these range from the lowest risk in green, uh, such as the M18 here, through yellow, orange and red to the highest risk routes shown in black. Altogether, we now include almost 4,000 routes in our analysis, covering all of Britain's motorways and A-roads outside central London. Uh, here's a slightly larger extract, extract from the full map that's um, in the report that we've published today. Um, you can find the, the map on our website, uh, the, the report on our website. Uh, although the motorway and A-road network represents only around 13% of Britain's road length, it accounts for, for some 60% of road deaths. Um, you can also access an interactive version of the map produced by our, our friends at Agilisys, also via our website, which is roadsafetyfoundation.org. Just go to Tools and then the Crash Risk Mapping Data Portal. Uh, as you can see, this year we're looking at the three-year period from 2017 to 2019. Um, although the headline 2020 figures were, were published uh, in, the, in the last few weeks, we don't yet have these figures available at the root level. Um, so our figures this year haven't been affected by, by the COVID pandemic, um, but will first impact our figures in our, in our results next year. However, Susie will talk about some of the uh, longer term changes in travel, travel patterns uh, later on. Um, as Ants mentioned, out of our 4,000 routes, 26 routes were significantly improved between 2014 to 16 and 2017 to 2019. Um, including four routes on the strategic road network and four on the major road network in England. On the 10 most significantly improved routes, the number of crashes fell by some two thirds. Um, this map highlights just three examples of, of significantly improved routes. So on the western side of the map is the M6 between Lancaster and Penrith. Um, there was a reduction from 50 fatal and serious crashes between 2014 and 2016 here to 27 fatal and serious crashes between 2017 and 2019. Highways England improved the roadside barriers on this route, for example, and Lancashire County Council also improved some of the slip roads as part of a wider scheme. Um, also on the slide, the A167 in Newcastle Gateshead had, had an even bigger reduction percentage-wise in fatal and serious crashes, from 28 in 2014 to 2016, to just nine in 2017 to 2019 partly as a result of numerous junction and crossing improvements. The other significantly improved route here is the A688, which is between the A68 and the now infamous Barnard Castle. Modest signing and lining improvements were amongst measures which reduced the number of crashes on this route from 14 to just two. But this year's most significantly improved route is the A3095 in Bracknell Forest between Sandhurst and Hawthorne Hill, highlighted on this map in yellow. I hope it's coming across on the screen all right. Um, in 2014 to 2016 there were 20 fatal and serious crashes on this route and you can see on the right hand side here that the numbers were increasing. So on this graphic the black line indicates the numbers of fatal and serious crashes and the green bars indicate all reported injury crashes. However despite the increase in traffic on this route the number of fatal and serious crashes managed to fall from 20 to 5 between 2017 and 19. Congratulations to Bracknell Forest for their work to improve safety on this route. Um, a junction was realigned, making it a T junction and improving visibility. The speed limit on a stretch of the route was reduced to better fit with the road's design and function, and light controlled crossing facilities were introduced. The eagle eyed amongst you may, may have spotted that this isn't a 70% reduction. The reduction indicated here, like the numbers in the report, has been adjusted to correct for the historic underreporting of serious crashes. 
on the other hand, as uh, as Ant mentioned earlier, there were there were seventy one persistently higher risk rural routes, uh, seventy one persistently higher risk routes. Um, these are routes which meet various criteria, such as having a minimum length and crash density, and which were classified as either medium to high risk or high risk, i.e. red or black, in both 2014 to 2016 and 2017 to 2019. 37, routes of the, 37 of these routes were rural, and this table shows the top five, all of which happen to be single carriageways, um, but there were also 34 persistently high risk urban routes. Some of these routes, of course, have been improved by the relevant local authorities since our analysis period. So the A683 in Lancashire, for example, is one of the roads being targeted with funding from the Safer Roads Fund. And the speed limit has been reduced on part of the A1028 uh, in Lincolnshire. Before I move on to looking aggregated results across the road network, let me just take the opportunity to express our thanks to everyone who participated on our consultation. We attempt to contact the relevant road authorities about every road that we specifically identify in these tables in the report and we spend some time reconciling crash numbers to ensure that our numbers are accurate. We also try to obtain details about improvements that have been made or which are planned and we're really grateful for all the effort that many road authorities have made to help ensure that we've reported accurately. Overall this year's results are very positive the number of fatal and serious crashes fell by 10% between 2014 to 16 and 2017 to 19, despite an increase in traffic. And this is reflected in the way the crash risk distribution across motorways and rural A roads has changed. The upper bar here represents the uh, distribution in 2014 to 2016, and the lower bar represents the distribution in 2017 to 2019. You can see that the amounts of low risk and low to medium risk roads shown in green and yellow have increased roads have been, been pushed down from high risk bands into the lower risk bands. On high risk roads, fatal and serious crashes are typically around 35 times more likely per mile driven as on low risk roads, with this factor having increased between the two time periods. While there have been safety improvements across a large proportion of the network, some of the very highest risk rural A roads appear to have got left behind. And this similar looking graph shows the distribution just for the combination of strategic roads across Britain and the proposed major, no, major road network in England. As we'd expect, a much higher proportion of routes are already in the lower risk bounds with very few roads in the highest risk bounds. Um, and again, the roads have improved between the time, two time periods, in this case by just over 10%. And now this is the the 2017 to 29 distribu 2019 distribution for all motorways and rural A roads, but now split by country. As you can see, the majority of motorways and rural A roads in England, the top bar here, are low or low to medium risk. However, that's not the case in Scotland and Wales, where a greater proportion of the motorway and rural A road network remains high or medium to high risk. And here we have the average crash rate split by country and network. Note that the first bar here again combines the strategic road network and the major road network in England, as these two networks combined are more comparable with strategic roads in Scotland and in Wales. As we might expect, the average crash rate on the higher level roads is lower than that on lower local A roads in all three countries. Um, this highlights that our busiest, fastest roads are, on average, far safer than local A roads. Motorways are relatively safe, for example, as they're specifically designed to reduce the prevalence of head-on crashes. It's also perhaps worth noting that the difference in crash rates between the high level roads and local A roads is greater in England than in Scotland or Wales. And just coming back to that first bar again, when viewed alone, the crash rate on the major, major road network in England is much higher than on strategic roads, with a crash rate nearly five times that on the strategic road network in England. Having touched on some of the types of crash that are less likely to occur on, on some road types, I now want to come on to crash types across the Eurorack network and again for the 2017 to 2019 period. On urban roads, the most common crash type is crashes involving vulnerable road users. This category including pedestrians, cyclists and where relevant equestrians. And a further third of crashes are at junctions. On rural roads, the second bar here, Without the same level of use by pedestrians and cyclists, the most common crash type is crashes at junctions. And there were also substantial numbers of runoffs. 
and on motorways, the most common crash type is rear end shunts. As I touched on, their design means that there are thankfully few head on crashes and crashes involving vulnerable road users, which are on, in this case on our fastest and busiest roads. Coming back now to the changes between the two data periods, and again here split by country. We're talking about the crash rate again here, so the number of fatal and serious crashes per billion vehicle kilometres travelled, reflecting individual risk. For Britain as a whole, there was a 13% decrease in the crash rate between the two periods, indicated by the green bar here. But there was actually a substantial decrease in the crash rate in all three countries, England, Scotland and Wales, with the greatest reduction in Scotland, a 17% decrease. And here's the breakdown of the English figures, just an English figure on that last slide by region. Um, there's actually been a substantial reduction in the crash rate in every English region between the two three year periods. And the most impressive reductions are in the West Midlands and the Northeast. And, and this graph shows the resulting crash rate in each English, re English region for the latest three year period following those changes. Uh, following the impressive reduction seen on that last slide, the English region with the lowest crash rate is the West Midlands followed closely by the East of England. Um, on the other hand, the potential to reduce the crash rate now appears to be greatest in Yorkshire and the Humber. Now, everything that we've looked at so far has been based on the crash rate, the individual risk, but I'm now going to briefly talk about the crash density, which we often refer to as the collective risk. We calculate crash density using exactly the same fatal and serious crash numbers as for the crash rate, but instead of dividing by the traffic volume, we use the route's length as the exposure factor or denominator instead. A short route with a very high crash density may have been thought of historically as a cluster site. So crash density may be a more meaningful measure of a route safety for road authorities than crash risk itself. And as we can see here, the pattern can be quite different. Whereas the crash rates were a lot lower on higher level roads than on local A roads, crash densities are much more similar between the two sets of roads in each country. And as we can see here, crashes are actually much more concentrated on motorways and A roads in England than is the case in Scotland or Wales. More notable still though, is that the crash density on the major road network in England is much higher than anywhere else on the motorway and A road network across Britain. So that's the end of my formal presentation. I, if there's time, I'd like to uh, do a demonstration of our uh, of some of the tools that are available online. Susie's nodding, that's a good sign. She's got a better uh, better clue as to the time than me. Um, so um, firstly, this is the Dangerous Roads, as it's called, the Dangerous Roads website, which is provided by Aegeus. Um, and you can just find it at dangerousroads.aegeus.co.uk. So this website is aimed primarily at the general public it works well on a mobile phone and it contains the data for the 2017 to 2019 period. Um, this initial splash screen provides the key, the colour scheme um, indicating the, uh, the risk bandings and also then indicating that smiley faces mean most and most improved road and the sad faces indicates a persistently higher risk road. Once you've typed in a location, you can then, oh, if I can type this morning, there we are. Um, it will zoom to an area and you can see the individual uh, colours of the roads of motorways and A roads um, on exactly the same scale as, as we've been presenting uh, this morning. Um, and then the, the grey dots indicate crash locations. The number at the bottom left uh, varies then depending on how zoomed in you are. So uh, if I just zoom in a little bit, so this is our most improved road here and then this number will update, there we are. <laughs> Always good when technology works. And then um, the bar on the left hand side here um, includes the key again and with the option to read more where you can find out more details about how the numbers are calculated and so on. Coming on to the tools provided by Agilisys, which are aimed primarily at practitioners. Um, you can access this at rsfmaps.agilisys.co.uk or via our website. Now I've clicked on the detail and layers tab here um, because there's there's uh, functionality here that I, I just want to be able to show you. So first of all, um, there are filters on the left hand side, so you can filter to just, for example, the persistently higher risk roads or the significantly improved roads and the map will update. And there, there are green and yellow roads on here. Um, and that's because the persistently higher risk roads are now green or yellow um, in the main. 
and you can click on an individual route to find out more about it. I'm going to keep picking on this road in Bracknell. Um, so you can see, for example, it's road length and also further down here, you can see how many crashes were, there were of each severity in each year. And if you zoom in further, you can then see individual crash locations. So here the black dot represents the location of a fatal crash um, on the red dots indicate the location of a serious crash. And when you click on the individual uh, crash locations, it will tell you what type of crash happened there including whether it involved a powered two-wheeler or not. You can also see on this map, I'm going to just zoom out again and switch that filter off. And I'm going to put this filter on. You can see our, our, our crash risk uh, Britain investment package map. Now, Susie will touch on this a bit later, but just so you know, you can find it on, on, the, on the website fairly easily just with that, with that filter. You can also see results for um, uh, an, uh, the earlier three year period. So if you wanted the results instead of for 2017 to 19, you could go to the results for 2014 to 2016. And as you can see, um, slightly different shades, but, but the same color scheme. Um, and again, yeah, it's slightly different, um, different colors showing the, the difference in risk level in that earlier time period. Um, the two tabs here were about the crash density or collision density. So again, on the, on the scale, on the same scale of, um, on the same risk banding scale with, with green representing the safest roads, but these are the crash densities rather than the crash rates. And then also for the earlier period. Finally, I want to show you on the individual route dashboard, um, you can select a particular route. You have to click this little symbol up here first, and that's the bit I always forget to do. Um, and then you can select a route and you get some of the uh, some of the uh, graphics that I was showing in the presentation earlier on. So the number of crashes, how the flows changed. Now, in this particular case, there was no no change in the number of fatal and serious crashes um, between the two time periods. And also up here, you get these um, these dials which indicate the relative crash rate and crash density. There are two columns here just because the rural and motorway roads, uh, rural roads and motorways, sorry, are, are scored slightly differently or calibrated differently from urban modes. So depending whether it's a rural or urban mode, it depends whether you get the dials here or here. Um, I, I think that's that's probably it. I'll stop whispering on now. Do get in touch if you want to get data, if you're local, a local authority, for example, and you want the data that we've uh, used to, to calculate this, we can do an extract from the underlying data set and, and provide that to you. Um, and with that, Tony, I think I'm handing back to you. Uh, well, thank you, Brian, for what was a clearly a very fascinating presentation with masses of uh, valuable information that I'm sure is gonna be used to a, a pretty wide audience. Um, we do have time for a few questions, um, mainly about the methodology, other questions we could pick up at the end. And I've got one here straight away from Dan Campbell, who tell who asks um, or points out that the overall overall road safety performance in Scotland is improving at a faster rate than the rest of the UK. Meanwhile, the rate of Scotland's roads, uh, the rating of Scotland roads, appear to not to be improving in line with the yes, rest of the UK. Does this indicate that there's something else going on, or what do we need to be looking at in greater detail to deal with that sort of conflict? I'm glad he put that last bit in because I think I will have to look at that in, in more detail. Certainly the improvements in Scotland over the last decade or so have been um, have been really impressive. And I, I think what, what's come through to me um, just in, in, in picking out some of the results this year is, is that in terms of in terms of crash rate, the improvements in Scotland and Wales are, are enormous. Um, the um, yeah, um, but right across the UK, actually. Um, but crash density is, is still far higher in England. So it, it depends on what, what measure you use, I think, as well. So I might have to get back to you, Dan, on, on, on some of the detail there, um, just to try to, to clarify some of that. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we've also got a, a sort of a comment from uh, Aaron Skrinivasan, uh, who says it could be helpful to show driven miles for each category to highlight improvements. What do you think about that suggestion? Uh, driven miles, did you say? driven miles yeah so the the crash rates are based on per mile driven um per per mile of um 
yeah, so ve when, when I talk about vehicle kilometres, effectively what we're doing there is taking the number of vehicles on any particular route and multiplying it by the length in order to get the vehicle kilometrage. So the total amount of travel, the travel volume, and that's what we use as the denominator for, for, for the crash rates that we that are the main focus of the report. All right. Um, I've got a, qu a question myself, actually, listening to uh, your presentation. I was just wondering how sensitive is your methodology to changes or variations in the input parameters? And is it all within acceptable tolerances? So um, that's a very good question. And it, it's part of the reason that we um, do the consultation, actually, because um, we're, we're very aware that depending on how a crash is, lo is allocated, um, whether it's allocated to one road or another, it could make quite a difference. But we also um, carry out, it's quite a, um, a high threshold, if you like, of, of a test of si statistical significance in the Im improvements. So we list the significantly improved routes by um, by how, how significantly they're improved. The most significantly route, improved route, route is, the, is at the top. Um, but that to, to be above 95% has significantly improved is, is, is quite a high, high barrier, if you like, to being, uh, to being considered a significantly improved route. There will be um, other routes that have improved substantially, um, but in a statistical sense, not necessarily significantly. That doesn't mean it's not meaningful. It, it, it can be. But, um, but yeah, the statistical test is quite a hard one to pass. Yeah. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, Nadine Mohammed has just been on and was just wondering... Uh, if individual or collective risk is more appropriate in urban areas? That's a really interesting one. And you might have noticed that in some of the slides I focused on rural roads. Uh, so our, our, our urban road um, methodology still needs, um, you know, we're, we're working on that all the time with, with colleagues from uh, um, from urban, urban local authorities. Um, I think at the moment we haven't quite factored in fully, if you like, the um, the contribution to travel that's made by vulnerable road users. Um, and and that, that's part of the reason that we use a different uh, set of calibration factors, uh, factors for, for urban roads. Um, but, but we probably haven't got a fully satisfactory answer for that yet. Um, I, I personally, I think, I, I think it, it's almost, um, it would be misleading to look at just one statistic. I think it is really useful to look at both crash rate and crash density to get an idea of what's going on. You only get a partial view by looking at any one figure, but it's a useful starting point. Thank you. And uh, Neil Gregg is asking, uh, is the detail of location of vulnerable road users, crashes in urban areas available in the report? Um, in, in the report, no, but um, yeah, on, on, the, on the crash risk map, you, you can get, uh, let me just see whether I can get to it really quickly. If I can, then great. Uh, so if I just zoom in somewhere, um, so yeah, here we are. So in Marlow, I imagine that, yeah, so so here we are. This is a vulnerable road user crash that didn't involve a, a, a powered two-wheeler. That happened. So the the vulnerable road user is a category in our in our in our way of thinking. It is a category of crash, um, and uh, yeah, so you, you can see the locations of some of those crashes. Certainly, you can find some. Um, I'd also uh, refer Neil and, and others to um, another website that uh, Gelesis provide, which is Crash Map, um, which can be very useful at filtering to just, for example, vulnerable road user crashes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. I think we've got time for just one more. Uh, I, I, oh, yeah, it's, what, it's something here from uh, Joseph, Joseph Story, which says, thanks for summarising the methodology. Uh, I wondered if some results may be biased by the high level of walking and cycling in urban areas when calculating levels of risk on urban as compared to rural A roads. Yeah, absolutely, Joe. And, and I, I mean, I just echo back to, to, to the point I made earlier about our, our urban methodology isn't quite right, but we're, um, we're really grateful to, to you at TfL and, and others around the country who, who've contributed to our thoughts on that and we continue to develop on that. Um, as you know, that's the reason we don't tend to include um, most of central London um, in, the, um, in our results, in our published results, just because we, we're aware that that would be really misleading. Um, because of the uh, contribution of, of cyclists and pedestrians. Um, we do include the, the routes in the middle of London if they're on the major road network, um, but um, they're the exceptions. Um, we sort of stop at the north and south circular as it stands. Um, but yeah, Joe, we, we want to do more on that and, and, and are looking forward to working with you when we get the opportunity to do more on that. Okay, well, thanks for that. And I think the time for one last question now, and that'll 
looks like that's going to be from me. And I'm just picking up on uh, what Lord Whitty reminded us about. And we're constantly told by others that we have some of the safest roads in Europe, if not the world. And But your findings of, in the report show there's still an awful lot to be uh, done. So what is it about the methodology that appears to be painting a, a slightly different perspective? Sorry, I missed the last, the end of, of that, Tony. What sorry. is it about the methodology that appears to be painting a slightly different perspective, showing there's a lot more to be done? So I, I think the thing is that um, we've come a long way, definitely. There's no question that our roads are, are far improved over even 20 years ago, but certainly sort of, I think probably the early 70s was the, was the peak in numbers. But um, the, the COVID period aside, I guess, you know, just talking about the numbers from, from a pre-COVID period, we're still having five people die on British roads every single day. Um, and, and it's somewhere in the region of 70 to 80 um, people who are seriously injured every single day on, on Britain's roads. That's phenomenal. It, it's a huge improvement since the, since the 70s, huge improvement, but it's still five too many. Um, there's still such a long way to go. And I think for, for me, one of the, Susie, I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on this later on um, when talking about the investment packages. I think there are really cost effective schemes that can help to lower that death toll. Um, and I, I think it's, it's almost easy to be complacent and go, we've got some of the safest roads in the world. Um, and, and that's true. We have had for the last decade some of the safest roads in the world. I, I think on international measures, we've fallen back a bit recently. I think Norway is now well ahead of us. Um, but um, but but that's just because that's where a lot of countries are, some of the safest roads in the world, still a long way to go, still some very dangerous roads. Um, so, yeah, I, I think um, it, it's easy to be complacent. And I, th I think that's what I'd, I'd want to guard against. Well, thank you, Brian. That was fascinating stuff and some excellent answers to the uh, questions raised. And that uh, now gives me the opportunity to uh, present uh, or introduce to you Dr. Susie Charman, the Executive Director of the Road Safety Foundation. So Susie, it's uh, over to you. Thank you, Tony, for the introduction and uh, to Brian for your presentation and for handling those very tricky questions. So um, thank you so much for that. Um, in my presentation, I'll be highlighting the main recommendations of the report, taking you through the reasons why we believe now is the time to invest in safer roads. And just a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll take those in the panel later. Last year, the United Nations declared 2021 to 2030 the second decade of action for road safety and the sustainable development goal to halve road deaths in a decade was refreshed. To support this sustainable development goal, there are 12 global road safety targets which cover all aspects of road safety from road safety management activities such as the development of strategies, action plans and time-bound targets through to safer road infrastructure for new and existing roads and those relating to vehicle safety, road user behaviour and post-crash response. The international backdrop is one of encouraging progress, though turning intentions into action may yet prove to be a challenge, particularly as the world struggles to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. Road deaths in Great Britain have followed a fairly flat line since 2012, with the numbers between 17 and 1800 every year. In 2020, there was a record low in terms of road deaths, with 1472 people killed and just over 22,000 seriously injured. The COVID pandemic and associated restrictions played an enormous part in this reduction though the 16% reduction in road deaths did not match the 21% reduction in traffic volumes. Our understanding is that during the first lockdown, vehicle speeds were higher, which may have contributed to the lower reduction in road deaths relative to traffic flow. As restrictions across Great Britain are eased further and the public become more confident in the safety of activities that they reduced during the pandemic, it's inevitable that traffic volumes will increase again. While homeworking may endure, there's a reticence to use public transport. And although people may commute fewer times per week, we may see people moving further from work, working within their travel budget. Our expectation, therefore, is that traffic volumes will return to pre-pandemic levels quite quickly, even if they haven't already. So without a step change in road safety approach and the investment necessary to drive this, 
the number of road casualties will also increase, with the possibility that they will too return to pre-pandemic levels quite quickly. Before we can return to the ambition of reducing the annual road death toll year on year, therefore, we need to lower the curve as casualty numbers increase again. While some people may simply revert to their pre-pandemic behaviours, others may form new travel habits. Indeed, in 2020, there was a 46% increase in pedal cycle traffic, and many people walked as, their, as part of their daily exercise. This increase in the level of cycling outstripped the very sad increase in cycle fatalities of 26%, meaning that the actual cycle fatality rate per kilometre travelled reduced. We have a unique opportunity to reshape travel patterns and better support healthy, healthier travel choices through the provision of active travel facilities like cycle paths and footpaths and a change in the way that we plan towns and cities. The vision is for people to be safer and feel safer while walking and cycling and for this to be inclusive for children, women and the elderly. Concepts such as 20 minute neighbourhoods and 15 minute cities put an emphasis on the livability of neighbourhoods. The idea is that you should be able to access everything you need, like your GP, dentist, shops, schools, leisure facilities, all within a 10 minute walk or cycle in one direction and 10 minutes back again. This should reduce the need for motorised journeys and such changes should help us to deliver lower casualty numbers while also helping to achieve health, exercise, net zero carbon and air quality goals. So why should we be investing in safer road infrastructure now? Investment in road safety measures doesn't just tackle road trauma, it can also help with levelling up infrastructure provision across the country and with a focus on building facilities for walking and cycling, it can help us to meet health and environmental goals. As well as this, schemes tend to be quick to shovel and offer high employment density just at a time when we need to protect jobs. Apart from the wider policy context, we cannot ignore the staggering societal cost of road crashes. In 2019, this equated to £33 billion. That's 1 to 2% of GDP. And of that, £1.7 billion was diverted from elsewhere in the health budget. That could have bought us around 11,000 double crewed ambulances or 61,000 junior nurses or 2,400 level three intensive care beds for a whole year. At a time when our health service is under immense strain with COVID related catch up, we can help free up resources through road casualty reduction. Simply put, building back better must also mean building back safer and building back in a way that's safer for people to shift towards more active travel. For the main crash types, the sort of measures we would typically find in road safety schemes include for crashes involving bumble road users, footpaths, cycle paths, and measures to reduce vehicle speeds. For crashes at intersections, replacing T-junctions or crossroads with roundabouts that slow traffic and manage crash forces, putting in turning pockets and enhancing delineation. For runoff road crashes, raise your edge line or shoulder rumble strips that give you that tactile rumbly feeling as you go across them. Installing crash barriers or removing roadside obstacles really do work. For head on crashes, central hatching in the median to separate vehicles traveling in opposite directions. These are simple, often low cost measures that have high returns. This table shows a summary of portfolio investment packages which could address the 10% of each road network with the greatest investment returns available over a 20 year period. The English investment portfolios have been balanced so that investment is spread equitably across England and doesn't just fall where there is the most traffic, for example, in the southeast. The table contains average costs and best estimates of casualty reduction potential to be used at the portfolio level for budgeting and planning. Road authorities could invest to rectify 10% of their road network every year or over a longer period. The timing for implementation of these 10% packages and their size could be flexed. 10% has just been selected as an illustrative starting point. There's a good case for investment on much more than 10% of the strategic road network in England during a five year period in pursuit of the zero harm goal, particularly when the contribution of infrastructure can be demonstrated. 
you'll notice that the sum of around 250 million is quite a lot higher than the current um, designated funds for safety and congestion. That said, we think the 250 million pounds might be considered just a starting point as very further very significant investment will be needed to steer Highways England toward that zero harm goal by 2040. Of course, we have used quite a lot of assumptions for these calculations, which are detailed in the report. But these are our best reasonable estimates based on previous work. And for all of the routes that are included in the investment package, an excellent first step would be to consult with road authorities to check on the various assumptions that we've made and to make sure that the works haven't already been undertaken or aren't planned to be undertaken in the near future. Together, it's estimated that these investment packages totaling 1.4 billion could prevent well over 11,000 fatal and serious injuries over the next 20 years, with an average benefit cost ratio of 3.7. These packages test our commitment to the value of human life. They provide an opportunity to invest in the safe system and safer provision for healthy mobility, and they meet the objectives of post-COVID-19 COVID economic stimulus. The investment package routes can be seen in the report, with some examples highlighted in the mapping. Remember, you can also see the investment map in the tools Brian showed you in his presentation. If you'd like to understand more about the investment package work we've done and what's in your area, please don't hesitate to contact us. Progressive approaches to road safety tend to focus on the delivery of a safe system. One important aspect of safe systems thinking is moving away from taking a reactive approach, for example, concentrating on locations where there have been a high concentration of death and serious injury, but instead taking a proactive risk management approach as is applied in other safety critical domains, such as aviation and mining and so on. The aim is to identify and manage known risks before crashes have the chance to accumulate. We hear from practitioners all the time how crashes are becoming increasingly sparsely distributed across the network. So a traditional approach to addressing crash clusters just isn't feasible anymore for the most part. And that's why in the crash risk mapping, we use longer routes for statistical robustness. We work with the International Road Assessment IRAP methodology because it helps us to understand the inherent inbuilt safety of roads for vehicle occupants, motorcyclists, pedal cyclists and pedestrians. And it gives us insight into the profile of risk at any given location by crash type. It also gives road safety engineers safe system inspiration for route treatments and allows them to test the impact of different options in a consistent evidence-based manner. This helps with prioritisation and justification for investment. After all, you can't manage what you don't measure. Highways England has a zero harm ambition for 2040, which is a fantastic commitment. And they aim to reduce the number of killed and seriously injured by 50% from a 2005 to 2009 baseline by 2025. They also have an IRAP performance indicator for 90% of travel to be on three star above roads by 2020. And the business is, take, is using IRAP data to inform its approach from starting to use star rating for designs for new major schemes to using the IRAP data to inform and assess road safety impact of route treatments. The major road network is a network of roads that sit just below the strategic road network in support and is run by local authorities. We believe it deserves a similar approach to its strategic road network given the importance of these routes and the poor performance of the network. As a reminder, the MRN has a crash density that is 50% higher than that of the SRN and a crash rate that's nearly five times that of the SRN. The major road network needs a long-term vision. For example, this might be zero deaths and serious injuries by 2045, coupled with concrete interim casualty reduction targets to set, um, set to guide and measure performance towards the long-term vision. The MRN would benefit from star rating performance indicators to measure the inbuilt safety of the infrastructure and to help prioritise and appraise investment. This would then drive the development and delivery of proactive evidence-led route, sa route safety remedial measures. And finally, it's essential that funding is found to address safety, as local authority budgets simply won't stretch to what is needed. The opportunity is clear. An investment of 275 million on the major road network across 1,000 kilometres of roads should pre prevent more than 2,600 fatal and serious injuries over the next 20 years with a benefit cost ratio of four. 
Kent County Council has already undertaken a major road network survey and others are in the process of planning and procuring theirs and this is helping us to further refine our understanding of what measures are needed and the opportunity that there is. If you have any thoughts or questions, please do feel free to contact me and I'll be delighted to take questions during the panel discussion for you that we have later. <laughs>